Hi, I'd like to welcome you to the Austrian Circle. This is the program where we talk about the economics of freedom here on WHUS Stores 91.7 FM. So thank you very much for tuning into my show this morning. Uh, I've been thinking about doing this particular show for a while now, but some recent news has really led as a segue into this show, and so I wanted to share with you what's going on with the $20 bill. So Andrew Jackson is being phased out of the $20 bill, and uh, they took a, a vote, a kind of um, consensus on who people thought the um, $20 bill should be occupied by. And the person that they chose to be on the $20 bill is Harriet Tubman. Now, Harriet Tubman is an interesting character because uh, she is, in all regards, a criminal and a lawbreaker, right? So uh, if we obey what the laws of the land are and what the government passes are the laws of the land, uh, we have to obey them or else face imprisonment or uh, face punishment by the state uh, enforcers. And so what Harriet Tubman did was to resist and to disobey those government laws that she felt were not applicable and were not just in the preservation of uh, rights and, and uh, applying to people in her life. So she was a slave, and we're going to talk a little bit about her history and what happened to her and what actions she took, but um, she was a slave, so she saw firsthand the problems with slavery, but she resisted the law and said, we are not going to go along with that. Uh, in fact, if you look back in history, you'll find that this is often the case with a lot of people that we hold in very high regard. So the founding fathers of America were criminals. They were lawbreakers. They were people who disobeyed the crown and the British government at the time. Many of them were smugglers. They just, um, the government wanted them to pay tariffs and taxes on goods that they were transporting or that they were uh, selling or buying. And these people, um, such as John Adams, and they decided not to pay the tariffs. They decided to hide what they were doing from the government so that they wouldn't find out about it. And they disobeyed the laws that they felt were tyrannical. Uh, even in science fiction, we see that this is often the case. Star Wars is a story about um, rebels, about people who are disobeying the Empire. So the Empire is a violent dictatorship that goes around the galaxy blowing up people's houses and planets and all of that stuff. Does that sound familiar at all? Does that, is that something similar to what's going on uh, nowadays? Um, and, you know, the, the rebels are the heroes. They're the people that stand up for the common man against the empire who is enforcing unjust rules and unjust authority by um, killing and maiming and destroying uh, whole entire planets. Uh, another example is Lysander Spooner, one of my favorite characters from early American history, uh, who in the 1800s set up an alternative and competing post office to the government post office. Uh, this was against the law. He was not able to do this within the framework of the government's legal structure, yet he did it anyway. He just set up the post office, he accepted customers, and started transporting packages. And he was incredibly successful at it. He actually was so successful that people were buying his products so much that the government had to reduce its rates in order to keep up with the competition that Lysander Spooner was um, giving to it. Now, eventually they ran him out of business because uh, it was illegal, because it was uh, against the government mandate for him to be running a business in competition with the government, yet he did it anyway. So my intention here is to point out that not all laws are legitimate or just, and it's libertarians that ask the question, is this law compatible with the non-aggression principle? Does it adhere to non-initiation of force against peaceful people? And if so, then it's probably a valid law. If not, we have to really investigate it and look at it for the legitimacy, and if it is not legitimate, if it is inherently an unjust law, then maybe we have to consider what the lawbreakers are doing when they decide that they are no longer going to adhere to a particular law. Um, so I'm going to read about a couple characters from history, and maybe we can talk a little bit about the legal structure and also what went into the decisions that these people made regarding that legal framework. 
So Wikipedia talks about Harriet Tubman, and uh, she was a runaway slave. She ran away in about 1847, and uh, Wikipedia says, After reaching Philadelphia, Tubman thought of her family. I was a stranger in a strange land, she said later. My father, my mother, my brothers and sisters and friends were in Maryland, but I was free, and they should be free. So she worked odd jobs and saved money. The U.S. Congress, meanwhile, passed the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, which heavily punished abetting escape and forced law enforcement officials, even in states that had outlawed slavery, to assist in their capture. The law increased risks for escaped slaves, more of whom, therefore, sought refuge in southern Ontario, which, as a part of the British Empire, had abolished slavery. Racial tensions were also increasing in Philadelphia as wages of poor Irish immigrants competed with free blacks for work. In December 1850, Tubman was warned that her niece, Kessia, and her two children, six-year-old James Alfred and baby Arminta, would soon be sold in Cambridge. Tubman went to Baltimore, where her brother-in-law, Tom Tubman, hid her until the sale. Kessia's husband, a free black man named John Boley, made the winning bid for his wife. Then, while he pretended to make arrangements to pay, Kessia and their children escaped to a nearby safe house. When night fell, Bowley sailed the family on a log canoe 60 miles to Baltimore, where they met with Tubman, who brought the family to Philadelphia. The next spring, she returned to Maryland to help guide away other family members. During her second trip, she recovered her brother Moses and two unidentified men. Tubman likely worked with abolitionist Thomas Garrett, a Quaker working in Wilmington, Delaware. Word of her exploits had encouraged her family, and biographers agree that with each trip to Maryland, she became more confident. Her leading more individuals from slavery caused abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison to name her Moses, alluding to the prophet in the book of Exodus who led the Hebrews to freedom from Egypt. While being interviewed by author William Siebert in 1897, Tubman named some of the people who helped her and the places that she stayed along the Underground Railroad. She stayed with Sam Green, a free black minister living in East Newmarket, Maryland. She also hid her near her parents' home at Popular Neck in Caroline County, Maryland. She would travel from there northeast to Sandtown and Willow Grove, Delaware, and to the Camden area where free black agents William and Nat Brinkley and Abraham Gibbs guided her north past Dover, Smyrna, and Blackbird, where other agents would take her across the Chesapeake and Delaware Canal to Newcastle and Wilmington. In Wilmington, Quaker Thomas Garrett would secure transportation to William Still's office, or the homes of other Underground Railroad operators in the greater Philadelphia area. William Still, a famous black agent, is credited with aiding hundreds of freedom seekers escape to safer places farther north in New York, New England, and present-day southern Ontario. In the fall of 1851, Tubman returned to Dorchester County for the first time since her escape, this time to find her husband John. She once again saved money from various jobs, purchased a suit for him, and made her way south. John, meanwhile, had married another woman named Caroline. Tubman sent word that he should join her, but he insisted that he was happy where he was. Tubman at first prepared to storm their house and make a scene, but then decided he was not worth the trouble. Suppressing her anger, she found some slaves who wanted to escape and led them to Philadelphia. John and Caroline raised a family together until he was killed 16 years later in a roadside argument with a white man named Robert Vincent. Because the Fugitive Slave Law had made the northern United States a more dangerous place for escaped slaves to remain, many escaped slaves began migrating to southern Ontario. In December 1851, Tubman guided an unidentified group of 11 fugitives, possibly including the Bowleys and several others she had helped rescue earlier, northward. There is evidence to, to suggest that Tubman and her group stopped at the home of abolitionist and former slave Frederick Douglass. In his third autobiography, Douglass wrote, Quote, on one occasion I had eleven fugitives at the same time under my roof, and it was necessary for them to remain with me until I could collect sufficient money to get them on to Canada. 
It was the largest number I ever had at any one time, and I had difficulty in providing so many with food and shelter. The number of travelers and the time of the visit make it likely that this was Tubman's group. Douglas and Tubman admired one another greatly as they both struggled against slavery. When an early biography of Tubman was being prepared in 1868, Douglas wrote a letter to honor her. It read in part, quote, You ask for what you do not need when you call upon me for a word of commendation. I need such words from you far more than you can need them from me, especially where your superior labors and devotion to the cause of the lately enslaved of our land are known as I know them. The difference between us is very marked. Most that I have done and suffered in the service of our cause has been in public, and I have received much encouragement at every step of the way. You, on the other hand, have labored in a private way. I have wrought in the day, you in the night. The midnight sky and the silent stars have been the witnesses of your devotion to freedom and of your heroism. Excepting John Brown of sacred memory, I know of no one who has willingly encountered more perils and hardships to serve our enslaved people than you have. So again, Harriet Tubman was a figure in American history who resisted those laws. The Fugitive Slave Act demanded that slaves be returned to their master, and there was threat of punishment to Harriet Tubman for disobeying these rules. While Frederick Douglass was speaking outright out in public, he was not actually disobeying the government rules and causing uh, the fugitive slaves to escape from their masters and get away from the enforcers of those government laws. So the next character I would like to move on and discuss a little bit about is Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks was also a character who acted in a very libertarian manner by standing up against unjust laws and refusing to give up her seat on the bus, saying that she was a person just like any other person and that laws that separated her from other people were unjust. So the story for Rosa Parks, as related to us by Wikipedia, says... In 1900, Montgomery had passed a city ordinance to segregate bus passengers by race. Conductors were empowered to assign seats to achieve that goal. According to the law, no passenger would be required to move or give up his seat and stand if the bus was crowded and no other seats were available. Over time and by custom, however, Montgomery bus drivers adopted the practice of requiring black riders to move when there were no white-only seats left. The first four rows of seats on each Montgomery bus were reserved for whites. Buses had colored sections for black people, generally in the rear of the bus, although blacks comprised more than 75% of the ridership. The sections were not fixed, but were determined by placement of a movable sign. Black people could sit in the middle rows until the white section filled. If more whites needed seats, blacks were to move to the seats in the rear, stand, or, if there was no room, leave the bus. Black people could not sit across the aisle in the same row as white people. The driver could move the colored section sign or remove it altogether. If white people were already sitting in the front, black people had to board at the front to pay the fare, then disembark and re-enter through the rear door. For years, the black community had complained that the situation was unfair. Parks said, quote, My resisting being mistreated on the bus did not begin on that particular arrest. I did a lot of walking in Montgomery. One day in 1943, Parks boarded the bus and paid the fare. She then moved to her seat, but driver James F. Blake told her to follow city rules and enter the bus again from the back door. Parks exited the vehicles and waited for the next bus, determined never to ride with Blake again. After working all day, Parks boarded the Cleveland Avenue bus around 6 p.m. Thursday, December 1, 1955, in downtown Montgomery. She paid her fare and sat in an empty seat in the first row of black seats reserved for blacks in the colored section. Near the middle of the bus, her row was directly behind the ten seats reserved for white passengers. Initially, she did not notice that the bus driver was the same man, James F. Blake, who had left her in the rain in 1943. 
As the bus traveled along its regular route, all of the white-only seats in the bus filled up. The bus reached the third stop in the front of the Empire Theater, and several white passengers boarded. Blake noted that two or three white passengers were standing, as the front of the bus had filled to capacity. He moved the colored section sign behind Parks and demanded that four black people give up their seats in the middle section so that the white passengers could sit. Years later, in recalling the events of the day, Park said, quote, When that white driver stepped back toward us, when he waved his hand and ordered us up and out of our seats, I felt a determination to cover my body like a quilt on a winter night. By Park's account, Blake said, quote, Y'all better make it light on yourselves and let me have those seats. Three of them complied. Park said, quote, The driver wanted us to stand up, the four of us. We didn't move at the beginning, but he says, Let me have these seats. And the other three people moved, but I didn't. The black man sitting next to her gave up his seat. Parks moved, but toward the window seat. She did not get up to move to the rede redesignated colored section. Blake said, Why don't you stand up? Park responded, I don't think I should have to stand up. Blake called the police to arrest Parks. When recalling the incident for Eyes on the Prize, a 1987 television series on the civil rights movement, Park said, quote, When he saw me still sitting, he asked if I was going to stand up, and I said, No, I'm not. And he said, Well, if you don't stand up, I'm going to have to call the police and have you arrested. I said, You may do that. During a 1956 radio interview with Sidney Rogers in West Oakland, several months after her arrest, Parks said that she had decided, quote, I would have to know for once and for all what rights I had as a human being and a citizen. So, as you can tell from that reading, the legal framework at the time was structured such that the government passed laws and people had to obey those laws. Now, not much has changed in that regard, but the structure of the legal framework has cha changed such that now there is no segregation that is enforced by laws. So, the Jim Crow laws are laws. The government passed them and said, uh, black people have to go to this restroom, white people have to go to this restroom. Uh, you can't drink out of the same water fountain. You have to go over here. You have to sit on this particular side. If you're black, you have to sit, you know, all these rules, all these laws were put in place by the government and enforced by the police. As you can tell from the Rosa Parks situation on the bus, the bus driver threatened to call the police, which are government law enforcers who do what the politicians tell them to do in regards to enforcing their laws. So if the laws are unjust and the police are enforcing those laws and people are disobeying those laws, can we really say that, you know, the police have to just do their jobs and just obey the law and they have to enforce all these laws? What, at what point do we say, wait a minute, wait a minute, this law, not quite just. We don't like uh, putting peaceful people who uh, happen to smoke some marijuana or have some drugs in their system. We don't put them in a cage and have them dragged off by the police. Uh, this is not just. This is not something that is in accordance with, again, the non-aggression principle, which says that nobody may initiate force against any other person. So a person who is doing drugs is not initiating force, and therefore no force may be, may be used against them. Uh, we can argue with them, we can try and convince them that maybe it's not healthy for them to do drugs, maybe they can um, go to uh, different uh, systems that will help them, but what we can't do is initiate force against people who are not initiating force. Now, Rosa Parks was not initiating force by refusing to give up her seat on the bus, but we also have to look at the ownership of the bus in this situation, right? So, um, uh, somebody coming over to my house, because it's my house, I can decide whether they stay at my house or whether they're invited in at all or whether, you know, I can kick them out at any time because it's my house. So if people are coming over for a dinner party at my house and at a particular hour I feel like going to bed, I could retire and say, well, I'm afraid that you all have to leave uh, because it's my house and I'd like to go to bed. And so the ownership of the bus really plays a role here in considering the justness of Rosa Parks' actions. 
Now, the buses were all owned by the government. There was a monopoly on the bus transit system at the time. There was no competing bus structure who might have offered uh, different services and uh, better quality products. And so because this was the only bus and it was uh, determined by the law that nobody could compete with that bus company and the government passed laws stating that the buses had to be segregated, then we can say that this is an unjust situation because the government is the one that has restricted any other alternatives that Rosa Parks might have been able to patronize, uh, which may or may not have been segregated uh, in, in a particular way. So the last famous lawbreaker that I'd like to discuss on the show today is uh, not from American history, but she appears in German history uh, during World War II. Her name is Anne Frank, and she resisted the government's demands that all Jewish people be turned over to the state to be carted off to concentration camps and all sorts of uh, very terrible uh, conditions and situations that would await those Jewish people. And so Wikipedia talks about Anne Frank and says, For her 13th birthday on June 12th, 1942, Anne Frank received a book that she had shown her father in a shop window a few days earlier. Although it was an autograph book, bound with red and white checkered cloth and with a small lock on the front, Frank decided that she would use it as a diary and began writing in it almost immediately. While many of her early entries relate to the mundane aspects of her life, she also discusses some of the changes that had taken place in the Netherlands since the German occupation. In her entry dated June 20th of 1942, she lists many of the restrictions that had been placed upon the lives of the Dutch Jewish, Jewish population and also notes her sorrow at the death of her grandmother earlier in the year. Frank dreamed about being an actress. She loved watching movies, but the Dutch Jews were forbidden access to movie theaters from the January the 8th of 1941 onwards. In July 1942, Margot Frank received a call-up notice from the Central Office for Jewish Emigration, ordering her to report for relocation to a work camp. Otto Frank told his family that they would go into hiding in rooms above and behind Apecta's premises on the Prischengrat, a street along one of Amsterdam's canals where some of his most trusted employees would help them. The call-up notice forced them to relocate several weeks earlier than had been anticipated. Shortly before going into hiding, Anne gave her friend and her neighbor two Coopers, a book, a tea set, a tin of marbles, and the family cat for safekeeping. As the Associated Press reports, quote, I'm worried about my marbles because I'm scared they might fall into the wrong hands, Coopers said Anne told her. Could you keep them for me for a little while? On the morning of July 6th, 1942, the family moved into their hiding place, a secret annex. Their apartment was left in a state of disarray to create the, create the impression that they had left suddenly, and Otto Frank left a note that hinted they were going to Switzerland. The need for secrecy forced them to leave behind Anne's cat. As Jews were not allowed to use public transport, they walked several kilometers from their home, with each of them wearing several layers of clothing, as they did not dare to be seen carrying lug luggage. The Achterhus, a Dutch word denoting the rear part of a house translated as the secret annex in English editions of the diary, was a three-story space entered from a landing above the Apecta offices. Two small rooms with an adjoining bathroom and toilet were on the first level, and above that a larger open room with a small room beside it. From this smaller room, a ladder led to the attic. The door to the Achterhus was later covered by a bookcase to ensure it remained undiscovered. The main building, situated a block from the Westerkirk, was a nondescript, old type of building in the western quarters of Amsterdam. Several of Frank's employees were helpers during the duration of their confinement. The only connection between the outside world and the occupants of the house, they kept the occupants informed of war news and political developments. They catered to all of their needs, ensured their safety, and supplied them with food, a task that grew more difficult with the passage of time. Frank wrote of their dedication and of their efforts to boost morale within the household during the most dangerous of times. 
All were aware that, if caught, they could face the death penalty for sheltering Jews. Now, Anne Frank was eventually found out, and her family and her were sent to concentration camps. They were sent to Auschwitz. Um, they, uh, somebody tipped them off. There was an anonymous, anonymous informant that let the SS know that Anne Frank was being hidden in the room that they were in. And uh, there were many others who resisted the Germans um, uh, ordering the population to turn over all the Jews to the government. Um, uh, Cory Ten Boom was another one in the hiding place uh, was a book that she wrote concerning her hiding from the Germans and eventually being found out and brought to concentration camps with her sister and being separated from her family and, and all sorts of terrible, terrible stuff that occurred to these people in the midst of the German occupation. And I like to point out that everything that the Germans did was completely legal. Them sending people to concentration camps, uh, murdering them, killing them with gas, all of this stuff was written down in laws that the government had passed, and yet, uh, you know, everybody was supposed to just follow the law. So libertarians point out that laws passed by the government need to be judged by an external uh, objective standard because the government can pass any law that it wants to. And whether or not this is just is, again, uh, up to, held up to the standard that we libertarians put forward as the non-aggression principle. Who is initiating violence? Who is initiating force? These are questions that we always ask when we're judging laws. And uh, again, we don't just say whatever law is passed, that must be legitimate and valid. We look into the law and we say, is this valid? Is it legitimate? Is it just? And does it hold up to the non-aggression principle when we inspect those laws. So kudos to the great lawbreakers uh, that have been fundamental in changing and shaping our society for the better throughout time and through American history and otherwise. And remember that the people who founded this country, the, the whole reason that we have our own country called the United States of America is because some lawbreakers stood up and broke the law of the land and set up their own country despite what the government at the time would have liked. So I hope you enjoyed this. This has been an episode of the Austrian Circle. We'll be back next week on another episode at 1030 in the morning on Tuesdays. I hope you have a great week. Take care.